If you'll open your word with me to Psalms chapter 125, verses 1 and 2. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Psalms 125, verse 1 and 2. They that trust the Lord shall be mount, as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As a mountain are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is around about his people from henceforth ever forever. May the Amen. Lord place a blessing on the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Roger, for reading to us from God's holy word. Thank you, church family, for your prayers and support of our young people and of pathfindering all around the conference. As we dig into God's word this morning, would you pause with me for an added word of prayer? Father in heaven, somehow, Lord, we're pleading with you to talk to us from your word. My, my words don't have power, but your words do. And so please hide me behind the cross. Please help your scripture come alive and touch our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to a New Testament verse. In the little book of Colossians. In a sense, it echoes the scripture from the Old Testament that Brother Roger just read to us. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The most important place for us to begin any Sabbath, every Sabbath, is at the foot of the cross. Because brothers and sisters, something happens when we come and reflect on the sacrifice of our precious Savior. We realize not only how much He loves us, but how much He longs to supply His power to help us live to His honor and glory. John 3.16 remains one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. I suspect you know it, and I would invite you to say it with me. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Precious verse comes from a powerful story, but let's stay for a moment here in Colossians 2. The Bible continues in verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. A few weeks ago, after prayer meeting in another part of our district, some ladies came up to me and said, Pastor, we have a gift for you. I said, oh, really? Yes, yeah, somebody brought a whole bunch of cuttings of an aloe vera plant. And we think you need to take some home and have your own personal aloe vera plant. I said, have you looked at my hand? I do not have a green thumb. I do not have any green fingers. I can't. Grow, I am like a death sentence to any potential plant. You, you don't want to send any of those clippings home with me. It, it, it will not be a good picture. They said, oh, we don't believe you. Take them home and make a long story short, I went home with these cuttings of an aloe vera plant. I wrapped them up in a napkin and they sat on the counter. I didn't know what to do with them. When moments like that come, I picked up the phone and I called my mom and dad. I said, Mom, I need some help. 
How do you grow an aloe vera plant from cuttings? Oh, that's simple. And if you don't know how to do it, I'll come over and visit you, and I'll show you. So, so sure enough, they, they came over, and they got this little, uh, little tray, put some potting soil, put some dirt in, put a little bit of water, and stuffed them in, and said, set them in the sunshine. Well, it started turning cold, so they had to go out uh, uh, in the living room in front of a window. And wouldn't you know, they began to grow. They began to get taller and taller. There began to be some new little shoots coming up. It was amazing. I was excited. It was working for the first time. Well, I really couldn't claim any credit for growing it because it was her skill for getting it planted and God's sunshine and water and, and, and air and all of those things. But it's growing. And it was exciting and invigorating. And it finally began to get so big that it uh, began to fall over and change colors. And I said, here we go again. The piece that was looking so good got so big that it fell out of the tray and it began to shrivel up and die. And brothers and sisters, as I read this verse here in Colossians, it strikes me that the exact same call, the exact same appeal is given by God for us today. Whether we're pathfinders and we're young and we're getting started, whether we're a baby in Papa's arms or, uh, or, or uh, a young one collecting offering or whether we are a grown-up and maybe a grandpa or a grandma or maybe we're in the golden or silver or whatever years of our life, it doesn't matter what our age God is calling us to be rooted and grounded in Him. Here's my dilemma. We should be having the benediction right now. But there is something I want us to check in with from Scripture. We'll move as quickly as we can, but do I have your permission to go a little bit into overtime this morning? Is that okay? Please bear with us for just a moment. Because brothers and sisters, there is a statement that caught me off guard. It comes from the book Desire of Ages, and it's worth us rethinking. And the reason I'm reading it is very simple. I was standing in potluck line a few weeks ago. Somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, every week, every week, Somebody, it might be you, it might be someone else, somebody talks about coming to the foot of the cross and being best friends with Jesus, yielding our life to Him. But I haven't heard us be told how. What that person didn't know is a few months earlier, someone caught me in the foyer, not in this church, but they shook my hand and they said, Pastor, I go to church every week. I study my Sabbath school lesson. I pay my tithe. I come to church faithfully. But I was thinking, if I died today, I don't, I don't have peace that I'm right with God. And brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how long our names have been on the church rolls, there is a message that God longs to have our hearts yielded completely to Him. And I heard about three amens. Let's make sure. God longs for His people, His army, His, His church to be yielded completely to Him. And notice this statement in Desire of Ages. It says, in none of His subsequent discourses did Jesus explain so fully, step by step, the work necessary to be done in the hearts of all who would inherit the kingdom of heaven. What story was that? Well, it's John chapter 3, middle of the night. Somebody comes to Jesus. 
One of the church leaders comes to Jesus. John chapter 3, notice verse 1. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus said, oh, thank you for the nice compliments. We're glad you're here. Let's sit down and chat. Is that what he said? Not hardly. Jesus cut right to the heart of the matter, zoomed right in to what Nicodemus really needed to hear. Not what he wanted to hear, but what he needed to hear in verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus had come to the Lord thinking to enter into a discussion with him. But Jesus laid bare the foundation principles of truth. He said to Nicodemus, it is not a theoretical knowledge that you need so much as spiritual regeneration. You need not to have your curiosity satisfied, but to have a new heart. You must receive a new life from above before you can appreciate heavenly things. Until this change takes place, making all things new, it will result in no saving good for you to discuss with me my authority or my mission. There's a powerful lesson packed into John chapter 3. Because Nicodemus reacts by saying in verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of, what everybody? Water. And of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, 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 let's hold our finger there for just a moment because I'd like to invite us to go on a journey to some other scriptures. Very quickly, let's jump back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Job chapter 14. Little three-letter name book. Just before Psalms. Job chapter 14. Notice with me verse 4. The Bible says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? And the answer is, no one. No one. Well, back in the New Testament, let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. Romans chapter 8. Notice with me verse 7. Romans the 8th chapter, the 7th verse. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And then let's jump over to Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 15. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. Check in here for just a moment. Matthew chapter 15, notice with me verse 19. And I would encourage you, since the clock is ticking quickly, to go home this afternoon and check out the chapter in Desire of Ages called Nicodemus. In Matthew 15, verse 19, the Bible says, Jesus speaking, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, False witness, blasphemies. Brothers and sisters, I need a new heart. How about you? That's the beautiful message of the gospel. And if you're taking notes, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, gives us a picture of that everlasting gospel being proclaimed with God's power all around the world. And it's a message that is explained and clearly in John chapter 3. 
In fact, here's a statement. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. When I was working at summer camp, I was convinced that I had some skills that come to find out I didn't really have. Our, I, those of you uh, have heard me talk about critters, I love any kind of animal, but I especially like horses. And uh, uh, the head wrangler at camp was kind enough to let me spend extra time with him and his crew. And one evening, he took me into town on uh, some time off, let me watch a, uh, a calf roping competition. Had never done that, uh, had never seen that before. But uh, what I didn't realize is while he was out roping, he, uh, his horse stumbled and uh, he uh, put, took a pretty hard fall. And uh, he didn't want to let on that anything was going on. But after he got me back to camp, he had to go to the ER and they ended up putting him in the hospital. So I got the bright idea, especially with him being in the hospital, that I should work extra hard to help his crew, because now they were short a person. And uh, to make a long story short, they let me pile in the, the old uh, truck and uh, go down and put feed and hay out for the, for the horses. And uh, we were parked between the corral and the shed where they kept their tack. But they kept their hay in an 18-wheeler trailer uh, just a few yards back. And they said, Ross, would you just back this pickup up to where the hay was? And I said, oh, sure, I'd be glad to. And then I realized it wasn't an automatic pickup. And I said, you know, I, I, there been, I, I've driven a stick shift before. I can do this. Let me, um, but but I, if I don't push the right pedals at the right time, I'm going to kill the engine. And I don't want to do that. So I, I, I'm trying ever so carefully. And you know what? It was so amazing. It started right up. I was backing it just like I was a pro. You've already figured out what happened, didn't you? <laughs> I heard this crunching, grinding, terrible sound. And I don't know what made me step on the gas, but uh, that didn't help matters. In all of my carefulness to make sure it started right and I was backing it right, I had forgotten to shut the door. And I had proceeded to rip the front driver's door off of its hinges because it caught on the corral fence post. Here I am worrying about keeping the engine running, backing, not backing in anything. And what did I, I forgot to shut the door. <laughs> to make matters worse, uh, when we finished the chores, they tried to shut it and it was obvious there was something wrong. They drove back, and flag raising was right in the middle of progress. Everyone at camp saw what had happened <laughs> to the truck. Talk about a lesson in humility, because I couldn't hide it. But you know, brothers and sisters, something happened when I picked up the phone. And I called the hospital. That was a tough call. Because here he's in the hospital because of a good deed he did for me the night before. And now I'm calling to tell him the good deed I tried to do for him backfired. And uh, I've wrecked his truck, camp truck. And he said, Ross, don't worry about it. I forgive you. 
we'll fix it. It's not the first time there's been a problem. Brothers and sisters, I can't look into our hearts this morning. I don't know what you are in church today struggling with. It may be hidden from view and only you know the doubts and fears that you are wrestling with God about. Or it may be like the door on that pickup, wide open for everybody to see. But God's grace, that amazing grace, His power is willing to change our lives if we say yes to the man of Calvary. Nicodemus teaches us a valuable lesson. (laughs) Because in verse 7 of the scripture, Jesus goes on to say, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Two statements. A person may not be able to tell the exact time or place, or trace all the circumstances in the process of conversion. But this does not prove him to be unconverted. By an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to the receiver, impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. How do we get those impressions? Let me throw out a couple ideas. Number one, meditating upon him through reading the scriptures or through hearing the word from the living preacher. Suddenly as the Spirit comes with more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. By many, this is called a sudden conversion, but it is the result of long wooing by the Spirit of God, a patient, protracted process. So what happens when the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart? Be you a pathfinder or be you not a pathfinder? By the way, once a pathfinder, always a pathfinder. Is that correct? (laughs) Absolutely. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, We know who's wearing uniforms today, but how many of you at some point in time in your life have been connected with pathfindering? Look at those hands. Amen. I wished I had a snapshot of that. That is awesome. So when the Holy Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. I heard about four amens. Let me do a quick reality check. We've come here into God's presence today. But is it your desire to go home closer to God than ever before? Is it your desire to leave this service today transformed by the Holy Spirit of God? He longs to do that. That's not something we have to say, well, if it's your will, I'd love to be transformed. Brothers and sisters, that is the whole reason Jesus has died on the cross. That is the whole reason His Holy Spirit is available to convict us of sin, to lead us to righteousness, and to convict us of judgment to come. Notice this. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Number one, sinful thoughts are put away. Number two, evil deeds are renounced. Number three, love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Number four, joy takes the place of sadness. And number five, the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Would you be interested in any of those things happening to you? If, if it were a store and you could pull them off the shelf, would you like to have a pure mind that the sinful thoughts are gone? Would you like to have evil deeds removed? Would you like to have love and humility and peace in place of anger and envy and strife? 
joy taking the place of sadness and a countenance that reflects the light of heaven. No one sees the hand that lifts the burden or beholds the light descend from the courts above. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. Watch this. It is impossible for finite minds to comprehend the work of redemption. Its mystery exceeds human knowledge. Yet he who passes from death to life realizes that it is a divine reality you ask me how I know Jesus lives he lives within our hearts Fred is not his real name but he received a Bible study response card and he sent it in and the elder, Brother Roger, of the church went out to deliver the Bible lesson. And they started studies. And they hadn't been going too long when the guy said, You know, I have two requests. Number one, I'd like to be baptized. Number two, I'm getting ready to go into the hospital. And I'd like to have special prayer that everything goes okay. So, so the elder said, no problem. And uh, he shared that great story at prayer meeting. And uh, about that time, got a phone call. Unbeknownst to the rest of his family, which is a whole other story, they had begun attending a different church in the same district. First question they asked when they came into church on Sabbath morning is how do we join the church and how do we become an Adventist pastor? <laughs> Amazing story. But, but the, the, the wife shared a burden that was on her heart for her stepfather-in-law, for this guy that had sent the card in. Because you see, he used to be a pillar of the local Baptist church there. And he was faithful every time the doors opened. He was an active deacon there. And yet suddenly he began to regress. And he stopped studying his Bible. He began spending more time on his computer. He got into some things he shouldn't have gotten into. He dropped out of church. And he went so far as to begin studying how to become a witch. Talk about night and day. And one day, as his heartbroken family uh, is together, she, she, she's getting ready to leave, and she said, I intended to say to him, why have you given up on God? And the words got all tangled up in her mouth and it came out, Why has God given up on you? And she got in the car and left kicking herself because she said, I wanted to do something to glorify God and bring him back to Jesus. And instead I stuck my foot in my mouth and I probably pushed him further away. She was heartbroken as I heard the story from him. He said when she said that, it shocked her, shocked him so much. And he knew better. He said, wait a minute. God doesn't give up on people. Oh, it's I that have given up on God. And just weeks after that card showed up, and he said, I want to get right with God. I don't know where we're at today. In his case, tears streaming down his face in the anointing service, he said, as I go into the hospital, I want God's will done. And as soon as I get out, I want to get baptized. Peace filled his heart. His sins were forgiven. 
And for some reason, a simple hospital procedure did not go well. And he went to sleep in Jesus. His heartbroken family said, I'm going to be honest with you. We're not heartbroken. Oh, we're sad. Don't get me wrong. We're sad. But we are so thankful that he did not delay opening his heart up to God and that he went into that operating room with his life consecrated to God. Because they said, we have hope in Jesus. I don't know where we're at today. Nicodemus was a leader in the church. But he had some things that needed to get right with God. It's as simple as asking and spending that time with a Savior who longs to fill our lives with his power. Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, I want to live for you? Is that your desire today? Father in heaven, If that's our desire, I can't look into anyone's heart. But this powerful story reminds us that as we look to you, just as you were lifted up on the cross, just like that story of the serpent lifted up on the pole, Israel looked and lived. We are asking you, Lord, to fill our hearts with your power to make us new each and every day and to use us to your glory and to our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's your desire, would you raise your hand and say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Please stand for our closing song, number 317. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorns.
Father in heaven, we thank you today for the message of this song. We ask that it will be the prayer of our hearts each day to humble our hearts at Calvary. Today, Lord, as we leave this worship service, may it be with you by our side, guiding our steps, filling us with your joy and peace and power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.